let's look at what a fellowship is. All right. Let's look at what fellowship is, because when James is speaking to us, that's what he's talking about, trying to bring us back to. So fellowship. All right. And we're going to use Brown Driver Briggs definitions and we're going to use the Hebrew definition for fellowship. All right. Because when we first come across the term, uh, that's where you're going to see it in your English translations. It's going to be in the Old Testament first. So let's start with the Old Testament first. So here we have fellowship and the Hebrew word is kabar. All right. Kabar is the word for fellowship. And let's look at some definitions here. And he even gives us the verb stems. And so it says to unite, join, bind together, be joined, be coupled, be in league, heap up, have fellowship with, be compact. And then it even says be a charmer. Now someone was probably wondering, what does that mean to be a charmer? Well, um, H2266 is the Strong's word here for Kabar, but the usage of be a charmer here actually has to do with, you know, basically being able to charm people as in cast a spell on them, you know, in, in some type of way. And that was the way that this word could be used. But again, these definitions or the way the word is defined is always going to be based on the context in which it's used. The uh, way in which it's used as a charmer it's very rare. It's most often used for these first few definitions that we gave, and that is to unite, join, bind together, be joined, be coupled, be in league, heap up, have fellowship with, and be compact. All right? So this is what we're talking about. So now let's look at the verb stem definitions. I'm not going to go into the verb stems themselves. We'll probably do that. I do have something that I want to do as far as language that'll come later, and I'll probably have Sister Shanti back um, and um, hopefully uh, Moray David Royal, who will be able to help us do the Hebrew with the verb stems. But 1A gives us the uh, call um, verb stem, and it says to unite, be joined. To tie, um, 1A2 says to tie magic charms of charms. So again, there's that definite definition. But for the purpose of this teaching, we are not talking about magic charms, all right? So don't get you know, off into La La Land. And then the Pael stem under 1B says to unite with, similar to 1A, uh, make an ally of. And the word ally also means fellowship in the context um, in which it can be used, depending on where you're reading from. And then it says to unite, join, ally, use it again. Then in the Pual or the Pual con, um, verb stem, to be allied with, be united, to be joined together. So we see that because you see so many times where it seems like the same definition is used, it's indicating that this is the manner in which the word is used. The verb stems let you know the inflection in the voice and in the conversation when the words are used so that you understand how they're being used. What's the emotion behind it? What's the intent? And these various things that will also help you um, understand which definition is being used. To be joined together. Then the hyphil stem to join together and to pile up, all right? And then you have the hit pile stem, to join oneself, to make an alliance lead together. So in every instance though, of this usage of the word kabar, it is used as a verb and it can be the root for other words in which it can be combined with, all right? which is what you know you see here actually divine, bind together. So it can be used for that. So this is what fellowship is. So the first thing we understand is that fellowship is something that is, it unites or joins together a, um, opposite parties, not necessarily opposing parties, but two parties. It brings them together. It binds them together. It couples them up. It allies them around something that they normally have in common. All right. So then let's look at an Old Testament um, scripture that shows us where this is actually used. So Psalm 94, verses 16 through 22. Here's what it says. Who rises up for me against the wicked? Who stands up for me against evildoers? Now, this is the uh, king and prophet David speaking. And so he's making this rhetorical statement or question. 
And then he's going to answer it in verse 17. If the Lord had not been my help, because it's the, that's the one who's rising up for him against the wicked and against the evildoers. So he says, if the Lord had not been my help, my soul would soon have lived in the land of silence. In other words, they would have took me out. He says, when I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. And this is another thing. The Lord's love is steadfast. It's consistent. You can count on it. Now, this is a byproduct of fellowship because David is in fellowship or this intense relationship with the Lord. These are the types of benefits that come with the fellowship. So there are benefits to a relationship, to a fellowship. And this goes beyond simply a religion. Because if you take the relationship out of religion, what are you left with? Nothing but rules. And you don't have to have a true fellowship with the one who gave the rules to obey the rules. And that's what we call going through the motions, just being mechanical. And a lot of people have that kind of relationship, unfortunately, with the Lord, which is no relationship at all. And they think that's going to get them into heaven. And you'll hear them say things like, but I'm basically a good person, but you don't love Yeshua. And so you're doing things really to be self-righteous because you just don't want to go to hell. But you're not doing them because you love the Lord. And there's a huge difference. And that's why all these folks be arguing on the internet and don't live nothing. Because if you loved him, then you do like he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Don't just talk about commandments. And the ones they only talk about are the mechanical ones. They don't talk about love your neighbor as yourself. Uh-huh. All these jokers run around here talking about some, yeah, we, we Israel. Look at them Edomites. Look at them, them people from Esau. And the scripture says, love the Edomite because he is your brother. See, people pick and choose what they want to what they want to follow and obey. And then they think they're going to have a relationship like David. No, you're not going to have one of those. The person, again, that James said, looks in the mirror, walks away, and forgot what they look like. You can't even remember what you're supposed to be. The Lord is consistent. He's steadfast. But people are not. People are wishy-washy. Uh-huh. If people were Japanese sushi, that's what they'd be called. Wishy-washy. Hey, let me get some of them wishy-washy rolls. Because that's what they are. All right, so wishy-washy and throw some soy sauce on it. That. That's what people would be. So David says in verse 18, when I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O Lord, held me up. So he's walking in what? The perfect law of liberty. Does he know if my foot slip, the Lord is there to catch me and set me back on my feet the right way. He says, when the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. In other words, you always give me another way to look at things. You give me what I need to get me through the moment. And then verse 20, here's where we're going to find the word kabar. Can wicked rulers be allied with you? Those who frame injustice by statute. All right. Now, in your uh, for those who are King James readers, um, it's going to say this: Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? Now, let's work here a little bit. So here's what he's saying, and, and he puts it in question form, but he's actually making a statement. He's saying that wicked people are not in fellowship with you. And he says they frame injustice by statute. In other words, they will literally use a law or that which is legal to do unrighteousness 
and then declare they followed the law. Well, it's in the law. I did it. Well, you know, slavery was legal too at one time. It's still wrong. But it was legal. See, this is what we see too in our governments. People legislate stuff all the time just so they can say, well, it's legal so I can do it because there's a law that says you can. But the scriptures tell us all things that are lawful for me are not expedient for me. So that means just because I can doesn't mean I should. Because it's the very thing that's legal that might land you in hell because it's not allowed by the king. It's legal in the courts and the world of men, but not in the kingdom of heaven. And he's saying you got wicked rulers and people on this earth and in this life, you know, that will do unrighteousness based on the rules they made up. Based on the laws they passed. And then think that you approve of this. And he said, no, they, they're wicked. So they're not in fellowship with him. That's not the kind of government that he's blessing. All right. We know that the scriptures talk about that the magistrate or the persons who are in power, the powers that be are ordained of God. That's only when they're doing the will of God. All right. The political offices are ordained because why? Governments are to be in place to take care of the people, but the activity or actions of those in the office aren't always ordained of the Lord because a lot of stuff that they legislate and pass is oppressive to people or unrighteous and God ain't behind that. So David, when he says this statement again, this goes back to what James was saying. Fellowship has to be based on the right religion or relationship has to be based on the right religion. In other words, the rules, statutes, commandments, and ordinances that I pass or that I follow to do things the right way can't be out of my spirit, but they got to be out of the Holy Spirit. Because he's the way, the truth, and the life, and he's the one who knows which way is right. But when men do it on their, on their own and according to what they want, this is what you're going to oftentimes get. Unrighteousness, injustice, and oppression, and all the things that the Lord hates. And so David is making a statement because there's a lot of unjust people coming at him at a particular time in his life. And he's saying that I know the Lord is not with them, but he's with me against them because he sees my behavior, my conduct. He can't have fellowship with him and live it unrighteously. They got the wrong religion. So he says they band together against the life of the righteous and look and condemn the innocent to death. You know, we see this all the time. People on death row who shouldn't be there, they get sent to an early grave because of injustice. People are doing 19, 20, 30 years of their lives in prison and are innocent. I'm not saying everybody is innocent. I'm not going to be one of them people standing outside the jail going, free my homie, little pookie. No, most of the time, them jokers are right exactly where they need to be. Everybody is not innocent. But the ones that are shouldn't be there. But the way they got there is often quite sinister and evil. He says, but the Lord, look at this now. He's showing his fellowship with the Lord. Because the wicked rulers don't have this kind of fellowship because they don't have this kind of trust. But the Lord has become my stronghold and my God, the rock of my refuge. Y'all see what he's saying here? So here's some New Testament scriptures that bring out this point. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you all some words, some of the definitions we're going to give you, but I'm going to leave probably one out in particular because I want you to do a little work on your own and look this up. But here are some scriptures from the New Testament that use the term fellowship 
And the term that you're going to see most often translated uh, into fellowship from the Greek is the word koinonia. You've probably heard that word before if you've been in any type of, of church or, or Bible believing community at all um, at any time. Koinonia. All right. So most in most cases where you see fellowship, you're going to see the Greek word behind it, koinonia, but not all, all the time. But where there's a different word used, we're going to try to translate or define it so that you understand what it means. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 says, God is faithful by whom you were called into what? The fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we're in the what? The koinonia. All right. So or the kabar. We're united. We're joined together. We're bonded with him. All right. So the koinonia word in the Greek corresponds to the Hebrew word kabar in the Hebrew. Then 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Look at what it says. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship koinonia has light with darkness. Now the word partnership that's used right there is different. And the word used there is metoke. All right. And metoke means participation. All right. That's the word being used there. So in other words, so we don't participate. Okay. In unrighteousness or in um, lawlessness, all right? And so when he says to us this, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, this is a warning because people who you're not in fellowship with normally have a different set of standards that they live by and they have a different set of goals. And if you're unequally yoked with them, is the image here is of two oxen that have different size yokes on them. One is short, one is long, and you're trying to plow the field together and you can't do it. Because when you need to turn, the long one and the short one, they're not gonna be able to do it. They're gonna be going, they're gonna end up collapsing. It's gonna fall apart. And that's how a lot of relationships fall apart too, because we be unequally yoked with folks going in the wrong direction or the opposite direction from us. And you're trying to force fit it and it's just not going to happen. This even happens with people in personal relationships. Oh, man, she's so fine, though her hair's so long, man. Look at them legs. I just got to have her. I got to be with her, you know. But, man, y'all unequally yoked. I don't care how fine she is. She ain't going to be the one for you. But dudes become enamored with what they see, and they just got to go after it. And then later on, you end up like a story that my pastor told me a long time ago. It was two men in a mental institution at separate ends of the floor. And one man was hollering, Susie, Susie, oh, Susie. So the psychiatrist went over to him and said, why are you calling for Susie? And he said, because I wanted her and I couldn't get her. And I lost my mind. So then the other guy at the opposite end going, Susie. Oh, Susie. Susie. So the psychiatrist go down there. And he say, why are you calling for Susie? He said, because I wanted her and I got her and I lost my mind. See? <laughs> If everything ain't for you, <laughs> it ain't always for you. You be unequally yoked to something because you want it so bad and then you end up crazy because you got it. <laughs> so you don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. It's going to be too difficult for y'all to get along. All right. And it's going to be all kinds of wrong. All right. And then it says, well, what fellowship is like with darkness? Then Ephesians. Chapter 5, verses 10 through 11 says this, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Now catch that, discernment, paying close attention, listening to the leading of the Lord, 
listening to the Ruach as it speaks to you and gives you direction. You want to know and understand what does the Lord want? That's the first thing. And when you know and understand what the Lord wants, then the second thing becomes easier to do. And look at what he says in verse 11. Take no part in what? The unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So now that I've discerned what pleases the Lord, I clearly see what are the unfruitful works of darkness. And rather than taking part of them, I'm going to expose them so that others avoid them. And this is a lot of times what people don't want to do. Well, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to say nothing because I don't want no trouble. But you're supposed to ring the alarm. And I don't mean you got to act crazy and be, you know, all fanatical carrying signs and jumping on top of people's desk and bothering them at their house and pouring blessed oil on people's cars and properties. And you're just a vandal at that point. You're a criminal. And they should come out and tase you or shoot you with a water hose and wet you all up so your goofy butt don't come back if you're doing stuff like that. I hope they don't shoot you, you know, but just make you miserable. Sick the dog on you to you know, bite a patch out your pants or something. But don't be doing stuff like that. That's not how you expose it. You expose it by standing firm for the truth and against these things when they raise themselves up. So in your King James Version, where it says take no part, it says have no fellowship in the unfruitful works of darkness. That's what you're going to see there. All right. And so what it's the word that's actually being used there, it, the Greek word is, is one of them big words, too. All right. It's it, it almost sound like a like a kung fu movie um, in the actual, you know, Cantonese or, or Mandarin language. But the word there. All right. For fellowship that's used here is sun koi no neo. Say that 10 times real fast. All right. And don't mess up. Sun koi, sun koi no neo. And the word means to share in company with, that is, all right, to, in other words, co-participate. And this is a verb. So you may not have started the thing, but you're going along with the thing. You're going along with those who are doing it. In other words, you're a silent supporter. And here the scripture demand that you take action against it. And you say, no, I don't agree with that. I'm not going along with that. You don't just sit there and clap and approve it and say, well, I support you, but I don't support that. No, I don't support that. And if that's what you're about, I don't support you either. Because that's not what I'm about. That's not what my Lord is about. I have discerned what pleases him. And he's told me not to have no fellowship with this. And that's what you in fellowship with. So I'm, I'm, hey, look, I'm not gonna have no soon koi no nail to, you know, with this. Now don't say that to them because then they might think you crazy because it sounds like you're speaking in tongues, going up to people talking about something. Look, we ain't gonna have no soon koi no nail. I'm just telling you right now. All right, that's how some of y'all sisters be turning them brothers down when they be trying to get a little too close. Y'all can use this word for that. All right. So when you go on a date, you court, <laughs> brother trying to be, give you that stretch. Oh, you know, put his arm around you, try to, you know, rub you a little too close. <laughs> you turn and look at him and go, look, brother. Shoot for no nail. And I mean that. And then <laughs> go ahead, please. Put a soon call. Trust me. He won't try it again if you use a word like that. Old. But in any, in any event, these are a few scriptures that we're looking at. All right. So y'all sisters, get some ammo. All right. <laughs> From the soon koi, no nail. And you brothers get a warning. Don't end up crazy at the mental institution calling for Susie. All right. So let's look at first Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 14. Uh, all the way through 22. And let's see what we talk. Let's see some more of what the scriptures say here on the issue of fellowship. All right. It says, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Now, understand something. Most of the scriptures we're reading are always giving us some type of admonition or warning to get away from something else. Why? Because 
the things that they're warning us to get away from are the things that will pull us out of fellowship and out of our right relationship with the Lord. Understand this, Satan is religious. In other words, he had his own system and way of doing things, but it's always contrary to what the Lord wants done. And the world's way is Satan's way because it's always going to be in rebellion to the Lord. And that's why we get all of these different warnings. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Take no part in the works of darkness, but rather to expose them. So and again, it tells us, be, flee from idolatry. Get away from things that compete with your love and affection for the Lord. Because why? It's fighting for fellowship with you over him. It's trying to get in the middle of your relationship. It's, it's a home wrecker. You in the house of God and anything trying to wreck your home is trying to get you to cheat on the Savior. It's an idol. Even our own identity can become an idol. And unfortunately, many have made their identity exactly that. They've replaced Baal and Ashtoreth and Marduk and Molech and all of the ancient false deities and even some of the new ones with themselves. We're in a world going crazy. That's why social media is where, the way it is. Everybody wants to be liked because they're trying to replace not being loved. And the only way you can fill that void is with the love of the Lord. That's the only way you can do it. Everybody wants to be important. That has a lot to do psychologically why people make the claim of being Israel. And I ain't got no problem with that because I'm Israel. But you got to be balanced and be Israel in perspective. Now that I know that I'm Israel, what is Israel supposed to do? Because you got a job. You don't just sit there and gloat and say, I'm Israel and you're not. That's you now becoming an idol. And the scripture just said to flee from that. Some folks got to run from themselves in order to run into the Lord. Good God Almighty. Verse 15, I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. So he's giving us some credit. He's saying, oh, you ain't altogether stupid. So we sensible. We know what's right and wrong. It's just a matter of whether or not we want to do what's right or wrong. He says, the cup of blessing that we bless, it is not a participation in the blood of Christ. Oh, he says, is it not? That's what he says. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? So the word here, again, koinonia, fellowship. All right. Remember, I'm using the ESV, English Standard Version. So the translation is slightly different. It says the bread that we break, is it not a participation, koinonia, in the body of Christ? So when we take the communion, it represents what? all of us partaking of the same thing in fellowship one with another and with Christ as a member of his body, all right, and the ecclesia or what others call the church. Then he says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake, all right? We koinonia of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel, are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? Now, this word is koinonos, all right, for the actual person. And so it says, what do I imply then? So what am I telling you? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything. And this is going to be very important when we get to Acts 15. Remember what's being said here. He says, no. I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons or devils and not to God. I do not want you to be koinonos or participants with demons. So look at what he's saying in the religion, because now we bring in religion and we're also getting to the point of ritual. So he's saying in their religion, the pagans are doing it the wrong way because the object of their worship 
is not the God most high or the Lord most high. The object of their worship is a devil. It's a contrary spirit. So when they offer their sacrifices and do their rituals or their religious service unto these things, that's who they're doing it for. And he says, don't partake in that. That's why the saints were told not to eat meat sacrificed unto idols. He said, when the saints take communion, when we break the unleavened bread, when we drink the communion wine, we're participating in religious ritual that does what? Enhances or denotes our relationship with Christ and with one another. And he's saying that our religion is in opposition to the religion of the pagan. So don't participate with them. Verse 21, and he said, you, you can't be a diplomat and try to toe the line or, or, or straddle the fence. Because, you know, some folks, well, I don't want to offend them, so let me just go on ahead and, you know, bow to this statue and say, I'm done on Omega or Orium, whatever Tina Turner was saying. Y'all remember what she was saying. Y'all watched the movie. So whatever Tina Turner was saying, you know, to Buddha, you know, I'm just going to do that and get it over with. No, he said, you can't do that. You compromise. You're honoring the idol to spare offending them, and you rather instead offend God. He said, don't participate in that. If you go somewhere and, and they said, hey, man, we're going to sacrifice this girl, you know, to our God, great Gookamook, you better flee and call the police. Don't be sitting up there doing something. Well, I don't want to make nobody mad, you know. I ain't, I, I understand you got to, you know, please old Gookamook. I, I serve the Lord, though, but I ain't trying to tell you how to do it. And I know that sounds extreme, but, you know, this is the same mentality. It's what people be doing. Just letting anything and everything go. And these, these compromises start to show up in a lot of different ways. He says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't claim to be saved and behaved in a certain way. And then you go out here and participate with other folks who act in contrary to that and talk about how saved you still are. No, you, you can't talk about uh, quoting scripture in your social media profile, and then you got about 10 twerk videos, you know, and, and everything, and talking about some, this somebody's son and licking some man whole face that ain't your husband, you know, or talking about, you know, how you, you, you are, you know, a man of God, and then you at the strip club making it rain. You're drinking from the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You are walking contradiction. You are lukewarm. You ain't going to make it. So he says, you cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. And so partake there is metico for participate You can't participate. You can't condone. And think that this is going to be okay. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord, the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You can't do this. See, this is where the, the lines start to get blurred. Now, let's talk about, since we're already hidden now, into ritual. Let's see what that is. Because now we've come into the part of ritual versus lifestyle. So let's look at this. Thayer's Greek definition gives us a word because in the ESV translation, the word ritual is used in your KJV where it is used. And I'll show you that it uses the term service instead, but the Greek or the Strong's word is G2999. And the word in question is the Greek word latria or latria. Almost sounds like latria. And I guess you could say it like that, latria. All right. And so it means service rendered for hire. Any service or ministration, the service of God, the service and worship of God, according to the requirements of the Levitical law to perform sacred services. Now, 
here's the thing about ritual. Rituals can be performed without a relationship. So a person can very much be religious and have no relationship because they're doing what? Ritual. And they're in essence going through the motions. And this is where the nation of Israel was at when Christ came on the scene. A lot of them, especially the Pharisees and Sadducees who he confronted often, they were ritualistic. They were highly religious, but it was superficial. They didn't have pure religion. And true religion, biblically, is never absent of relationship. Where there's an absence of relationship and you're only left with religious ritual, you're just going through the motions. You have the mechanics, but you don't really have spirit. There's no life there. It's like worshiping in a cemetery. Everything there is dead. And so this is what can happen. Now, let's examine some rituals of service as they pertain to entertaining or to entering rather the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat were as the earthly shadow of Yah's presence on his heavenly throne. So because there was a lot of ritual that came into place during the time of Israel. And there was a reason for the ritual. The ritual came into place because the people were undisciplined and didn't appreciate the relationship. In fact, they rejected it. When the Lord starts speaking to them, they said, Moses, listen, don't ever let that happen again. From now on, you go up in that mountain and let God talk to you. We don't want him talking to us no more. When he wanted to be their king, they rejected him and told Samuel, make us a king like everybody else. And the Lord said, look, Sammy, don't get upset. Go ahead and give them what they asked for. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So the people historically have always rejected their relationship with the Lord. And they were more content to have ritual because they didn't want the relationship, but they wanted the benefits of the relationship. And so they would be very religious when it was convenient and follow the ritual, but they would never indulge themselves in the relationship to the point to where it became a lifestyle. Oh yeah, we get into the nitty gritty now. So let's look at Exodus chapter 26, verses 31 through 34. So here's what happens. When you got ritual in your religion and not relationship, you create barriers between you and the Lord. So look at Exodus chapter 26, verses 31 through 34. It says, and you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. And you shall hang it on all four pillars of Acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasp and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. Now, you know what? I actually have a picture of this that I can show you all. And I should have put it in this slideshow, but it just my, you know, I just forgot. But um, let me see if I can show y'all an idea or image of what this looked like. All right, give me one moment here. Because I'm gonna have to stop the share and give you a picture of what this looked like. So here's what we just read. This is an idea of what it would have looked like according to what we just read. You see the curtains with the cherubim sewed into it. 
the colors. And then beyond it, what you see is the ark. And above this, the cherubim were the mercy seat, so to speak, or represent the throne of God. All right, meaning the presence of the Lord would come in. So this is what this would look like. All right. So now, back where we were at. So this is what he gave them ritual. Now, here's what I want you to keep cluing on the highlighted parts. And you shall hang the veil from the clasp and bring the Ark of the Testimony in there within the veil. Now, the Ark represented what? The presence of the Lord. The presence of God was behind a veil in the midst of his people, rather than his presence being in the midst of his people. It was sectioned off. Do you see the problem with this? And the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. So now the designation of these areas as holy place and then the most holy, it also represents the fact that the people couldn't approach the presence of the Lord. There was something wrong in the relationship. So in order to keep him from destroying them because of the power of his presence and his holiness and these unholy people, he had to hide behind a veil. And he had to give them ritual just to be able to approach him the right way. So this is an, oh my goodness. This is where the religion got in the way of the relationship. And it wasn't because of the Lord, because he gave the people the right way to do things, but they was always doing them the wrong way. So he had to give them rigid ritual to follow in their religious practices so they could have some type of relationship with him, but not the one he wanted with them. Ooh. So he said, you shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place, the lid on top where his presence would hover above or be on to represent his throne. Kings don't rule from behind the veil. Their thrones aren't put behind curtains or walled off from their subjects. Their throne room is open for their subjects to come in and be in their presence and for them to go out and be in the presence of their people. But because the people weren't ready for the relationship with the Lord, he had to put himself, not the people, he put himself behind the veil. Oh my goodness, I hope we getting this. So in Exodus chapter 40, verses 18 through 21, check this out and look at verse 18. And I, I underline this in a big red line for a reason. Moses erected the tabernacle. Ooh, let's just talk about this just for a moment. Why did Moses erect the tabernacle? Why does it say this? You know why? Because he was the only one who knew the pattern. The Lord had showed him the pattern. Now somebody said, well, that ain't no big deal. He showed him the pattern. But here's, here's what you're missing. Not only did he know how to set up the tabernacle, Moses, the only one who actually knew how to worship the Lord. He, the only one who had a relationship with him. He was the only one safe that could be in his presence without ritual. Oh, oh, oh. Catch this now. Get this. Moses didn't have to go through all of the ritualistic ordinances of the people to be in the presence of God. He didn't have to bring no sacrifices. He didn't have to wash out no golden labor. He didn't have to put on special garments. Because his relationship with the Lord was so sure. The Lord just told him, come on up here. And he just went. The Lord came down and spoke with him face to face, the scripture says, as a man speaks to his friend. They saw the presence of the Lord in the cloud come down and take on a form and speak to the man. They saw the afterglow 
on Moses' face that was so bright they couldn't even look Moses in the face. And he had to put a veil on his face because God was on him and the people couldn't handle God. So God said, put the ark behind a the veil. They can't even handle me on you. Oh, man. That's why Yeshua told the woman in Samaria that the Lord is, the time is now. And the Lord is looking for true worshipers. Those who can go beyond the veil. Those who don't need the ritual. Those who not stuck at religion, but then progress into the relationship. They understand what the religion is supposed to do. Mm. So it says Moses erected the tabernacle. He laid its bases and set up its frames and put in its poles and raised up its pillars. And he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent over it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the testimony. Now, while, while Moses is doing all this, why he ain't got to have no sacrifices? Why he don't have to wear Aaron's garments? Why he don't need bells attached to his ankles to make sure in case he the bell stopped jingling, he died, they got to pull him out? Mm. He took the testimony. Not Aaron, not none of the Levitical priests. Moses did this. So he said, well, he was the lawgiver. Well, how did he become the lawgiver? He became the lawgiver because he was a love liver. He was living his love for the Lord. He got special privilege because he gave him special praise. He gave God his special place in his heart. And so he got special privilege. He got access that the rest of them couldn't get. Aaron could only go into the Holy of Holies once a year. Moses was there all the time. Always in the presence. If he wasn't in the Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies was on him because the Lord was with him. Hmm. He took the testimony and put it into the ark and put the poles on the ark and set the mercy seat above on the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the veil of the screen and screened the ark of the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. When I understood this and I read that last part and screened the ark of the testimony, I almost cried. The Lord had to screen himself off from his people because they couldn't handle his presence and didn't want his presence. They wanted his protection. They wanted his provision. They wanted all the benefits, but they didn't want the relationship. Man, oh man. Good Lord, Lord. Lord, Lord, Lord. Mm, mm, mm. Let's go a little bit further. Let's go a little bit further. Oh, yeah. We, we got some scripture here that we got to bring out. 